Welcome to the North Shore Podcast, a podcast about the lovely cities of the North Shore, featuring topics like local news, sports, music, people, and food. My name is Pete, and I'm joined by co-host Scoo Walker. Scoo, how you doing, buddy? Doing great today, Pete. How about yourself? Hey, you came back from New York okay? That's all right? That's a rough one. Rough drive, tough drop-off. You, you left all your kid and all your money in New York, huh? What year of college? She's a freshman at Fordham. Yes, I did leave oh. all my money and then some. Which God, ties God. To this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we have a sponsor for the show, NeuroNoodle. Hey, parents and athletes, your kids get a physical every year, right? We'll include a brain map so you have a baseline to compare it to in case something happens. It takes only 20 minutes to get the data you need to know if your athlete should get back on the field. Okay, one of the things we like to do here at the North Shore Podcast is put a spotlight on our local people doing local great things. Today we're joined with President Morton Shapiro and Professor Saul Morrison of Northwestern University. They are the authors of many books, but specifically Minds Wide Shut, How the New Fundamentalisms Divide Us. President Shapiro, Professor Morrison, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Welcome. We'll see if it's our pleasure. We'll get back to you. At the end. Oh, don't worry. It's still I'll early in the show. You, not about you, Pete. Okay. Our pleasure so far. <laughs> All right. From here on out, it's Morty and Saul, right? Okay. We're, we're just talking over a couple of sandwiches downtown. All right, gentlemen, can you give a little background on, on you both? Obviously, you're both at Northwestern, but we have many new listeners that are listening to the podcast. Uh, could you give a quick background on yourselves, whoever wants to start? Morty. Start. Oh, he calls on me. Well, you know, my name is Morty Shapiro. As you pointed out, I am uh, entering my 13th year as the 16th president of Northwestern. Before that, I was president of Williams College for nine years. But most importantly, I've been a economics professor for my whole adult life. And um, I teach and I write and I try to hold on to my administrative job during the day. So, oh, and, and, and Saul, what about you? You know anything about uh, humanities? Well, I've been uh, at Northwestern teaching Russian literature and sometimes other literature uh, for 35 years now. And before that, I spent a dozen years doing the same thing at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, my job is to get students to love literature. And uh, <clears throat> I hope I do. What, what an easy job. Some of your classes, now you guys both teach together, right? You have a pretty big class together. Which, which class is that? You know, Pete, we, we started teaching when I first got here. Uh, yeah, I guess the first year or so we met, we didn't know each other before, but we started my second year. So this will now be, I guess, the 12th year that we taught a course together. And um, it started, Pete, as a course on sort of how different disciplines approach the search for truth. I do empirical econometrics, so empirical social science, Paul, uh, saw courses of humanist, and you know we take different psychology, sociology, anthropology, physics, how do you approach the nature of truth? But the course has evolved over teaching it to now 1,300 undergrads at Northwestern into one on how to have meaningful dialogue. So some of the original readings, you know, are made it to year 12, but a lot of it's a new course because we really feel, and that's why we write, wrote this most recent book about how do you regenerate meaningful dialogue. Got it. And, and uh, Morty, uh, one more year, right? That's it? Yeah, president? you know, it'll be 22 years, God willing, as a president. And the average president lasts six and a half. So I, I feel pretty good about that. I'm still a professor, but... Uh, it's been a pretty long run and, and um, looking forward to their searching for president number 17 at Northwestern. And I have no doubt they will trade up. Right, Saul? No, <clears throat> no one will replace you. And I mean that since <laughs> my so professor will probably be taller. <laughs> are you going to break it here, what you're doing next, or we're going to have to still wait and see? You, you, know, have, uh... yeah, I'm not, you know, I still have a year. I, I actually have almost uh, okay, exactly okay. 52 weeks. I really haven't been thinking about it. I, I have, All right. you know, so many things to do. We got move in coming in the start of the football season Friday night. I'm just, or, I, I'm, Marty, not, I'm really not thinking of anything. 
Morty, a no will suffice. A no will suffice. Yeah, no, that's it's true. <laughs> People don't believe it, but it's true, Pete. You've got a great highlight reel. Uh, you've done quite a few things in your tenure. Uh, anything you want to point out that you're most proud of before we get to the book? You know, I, I let others figure that out. You know, we got uh, okay. a couple of things right. We got a lot of things wrong, but uh, it's really a, a wonderful place. I mean, there are a number of great research universities, global research schools, and we're one of them, but we're also a school that really cares about undergrads and scoop. You know, I, I know Fordham does as well. Your money is going to be well spent there for your child whom you just dropped off. But, you know, you know, there are research universities Saul knows about that you kind of phone in the undergrad because they, you know, it's so much about their PhD students and their professional schools. And we have great graduate and professional schools, but we really care about undergrads. And that makes me proud. I, I wish she was going there. That was one of her top choices. But, <laughs> well, it was our loss. She can come here for grad school. You know, we have She'd rather be 15 hours away. <laughs> That's home. a statement about you. I, I'm sure it is. Oh, believe me, it is. Easily understandable. But we have She's Kellogg right. School of Management, and we have a Pritzker School of Law, and we have a great medical school, and a whole range of master's and PhD programs. So we'll be looking for her. Okay, gentlemen, you got a whole bunch of books that you've done. Uh, and this latest one, uh, Minds Wide Shut, that's a sequel to Sense and Sensibilities. You wrote this one during COVID. What was the inspiration? I know it's a common question, but it is a common question. How did you guys come up with this book? What was the uh, spark that said, you know what, we got to get together on this topic? Well, let me say one thing about COVID, and we have that in the preface a little bit, that um, we were coming back from class in the middle of March of 2020. I guess it was our final class. And we had been working on the book for a year, particularly we started with the economics chapter and we were moving into politics, but we hadn't written religion, hadn't written the history of fundamentalism, hadn't integrated literature and, and all these things. And you know, I said to Saul, man, if we only had like eight weeks, we could really finish this book, but we don't have eight weeks because he's teaching again and I'm teaching, everything's going on. The next thing we know, the world shut down. So we had a lot more time to, focus on the book. And, and we did have a draft by, it wasn't April, May, but by the end of August, we had a draft and it went out to reviewers. And I think we put the book to bed in October or November of, of last year. And it came out in the, during the winter, but uh, we couldn't do the book tour that we did for the previous book because right. of COVID. But um, we're doing a lot of podcasts and the book seems to be selling pretty well. So do you want to talk about how we decided to focus on fundamentalism? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we were originally going to do a, a, a sequel just to Sense and Sensibility, which is about what, um, what economists can learn from the humanities by doing the reverse, <clears throat> what humanists can learn from economists. That was gonna be called Price and Prejudice, right? And, uh, but gradually, you know, with all the polarization in society and um, our class being just the sort of thing that would work in the opposite direction, we decided to do something on polarization uh, and the importance of real dialogue. So that, that's how that came out. And then we used that, you know, um, the material we had, the economics chapter, as a chapter of the book. Got it. Was it the uh, 2016 election, like Trump, did it spark this? What, you know, the shock of Trump winning, did that come into play in this book? You... Yeah, you know, Pete, it definitely was part of it, but it was, Trump was more of a symptom than the cause. Yeah. And so was Brexit vote, which yeah. was at least as shocking as, as uh, Donald Trump being elected president. Um, but we, we think that there are a whole bunch of forces that have led to polarization and the decline in respectful, meaningful dialogue. And part of it's is manifested with the extremes on the right and the left. And part of it is just that you know, people are living in silos now, echo chambers, a lot of people call them. And then, you know, when I grew up, it didn't matter whether you watched, you know, uh, Peter Jennings or Tom Brokaw or Dan Rather, you know, they all told the story pretty much the same, which magazine you read or whatever. But now with the stratification within media, you know, people are living in echo chambers and, you know, they hear 
their words reflected off the walls and makes them feel really good. Uh, we believe it's really bad for uh, democracy. That's why we really wrote the book, right, Saul? Yes, <clears throat> for democracy and for, you know, learning more about the world, for what, you know, a university is supposed to do, find truth, find better answers. You, that doesn't work very well when um, ideas are not open to criticism. So. Well, Morty, you brought it up. I mean, there wasn't as many choices, you know, back in the day. You had your three choices. Everybody was drinking from the same hose, and, you know, you could debate. Now, uh, you know, it, confirmation bias is everywhere. You know, you want to get – just keep watching Fox News, keep watching CNN. You get to hear what you want, and, you know – that's why I don't see the point. If you're conservative, you know what? No matter what Fox says, I'm going to vote for the conservative. If, it, if I'm on the left, I'm going to watch CNN. I'm going to, you know, vote for the left. There's just so many choices now. And uh, do you think that there's more choices? Social media is out there helping with the choices. It's really hard to have a common goal now for everybody to gather around. I mean, Pearl Harbor, Man on the Moon, 9-11. Uh, you know, we had just what happened in Afghanistan. That's not a big enough deal for the country to uh, uh, come together. What do you think it'll take for everybody to have a common goal? Because if you're in a foxhole or if it's fourth and one, you know, it's hard to find an atheist in that foxhole. You know, what, what needs to happen in America for us to get our act together? Let me start and sort of. And then Saul can answer that question. That's what we do as tenured faculty is yep. we have quite tough questions. And we say what we wanted to say anyway. But I want to get back to something, Sku, that you said right before we went live on this. And you, you said something like, well, you know, far, far left and far right. You know, I, I think I was the one who said they almost have a begrudging respect for each other. But what they hate is 90 degrees away. You know, 180 degrees is one thing, but 90 degrees they don't have any morality. They don't have any. I think that's what your point was, Scoo, that they just, you know, compromisers, compromisers, right? They don't have the strength of their convictions. And, and that's what this book really is about. It's about how to learn from each other, treat each other with respect, and, and really engage in a productive way, not in a screaming way that everybody's screaming and no one's listening. So, you know, that, that's uh, now how we're going to get there. And and actually, Saul and I are very different levels of optimism, mainly because Saul is, a, is an expert in Russian history, which suggests that the world is indeed coming to an end. But Saul, is there any event that could bring us together? What do you think? Well, <clears throat> that's a really interesting question. Um, it would have to be <clears throat> the sort of event where people felt that it was more important to work with each other than to use the crisis as a way to beat up on each other. That, that would be what it has to be. Um, you know, and, and you could tell, you know, and we've had many of those in our history, you know, um, Pearl Harbor obviously being one. <clears throat> um, but, you know, I find it, I don't think it's impossible, but I find it hard to, um, Imagine you know, what it would be now. It wasn't you know a pandemic which would kill. I mean, pandemic right. kill Republicans and Democrats alike, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you know, this crisis. You know, you know, in Afghanistan. I mean, okay. <clears throat> so now you get everybody <clears throat> criticizing the president, but they most want to criticize <clears throat> each other, right? Um, yeah. And what would it be? I don't know. Um, you know, if there were a you know, if we had a major depression, well, you could play the blame game on that. What couldn't you? <clears throat> and I, I, There probably is something, and I'm hoping it's going to be, but I can't imagine it. Now, Mo Morty, was it you that said, I can't remember it was in the book, because, you know, you had a couple weeks to prepare, and you got numbers and data floating in your head. Yes. But didn't some people on the left say there was 62%, they would rather have a meteor hit the earth, 60% chance than Trump winning what what was that yeah all about? i mean and there's a lot of data like that including some other recent polling that more than half of all americans say that the greatest threat to america is other americans now when i grew up with saul it was the russians 
And now maybe some people say the Chinese, but the greatest threat to America is other Americans. I mean, boy, that degree of polarization is just extraordinary. But you know, I'm much more optimistic than you are, Saul. And as I alluded to before, that you know, I, I do I believe there's a pendulum of incivility and lack of respect and uh, you know, open disdain for dialogue, and it swings back. And you know, Saul thinks it's more of like a snowball gathering up speed and volume going in, setting off an avalanche of the end of democracy, which is a little scary uh, to say the least. So, I, you know, I, I think that we're going we're gonna to come back uh, a little bit. But Saul, you, you, you're one <coughs> pessimistic guy, aren't you? Yeah, I guess I am about this anyway. Look, <clears throat> if you look at, you know, Russia in 1917, <clears throat> when it immediately had a democratic government, <clears throat> when the czar fell. If you look at France right after the, you know, <clears throat> the execution of Louis XVI, and you had a very radical democratic government, what happens is that at, you get accelerating intolerance so that, the, you know, okay, our, <clears throat> our group has won. We can get rid of all the people on the other side and have a terror and execute. But then they split. <clears throat> you know, and then they split and they split, you know, over and over again. Finally, Robespierre, you know, gets it, right? I mean, um, and then the people who got him, by the way, got it after that. You know, it, you think you've won, but it gets worse and worse at an accelerating rate. And what I see, you know, look, there were articles in the New Republic in the 90s about, I, I have them, I saved them, about the, um, the crisis in free speech on campus <clears throat> being, being a crisis already back then. But you know, it didn't change a whole lot from the late 1990s. It changed to 2010. But the change has been accelerating enormously, right? And both in society in general and uh, on campuses. And you know, that's why I think it's a snowball going downhill. You know, you know, and at the rate we're going, um, basically, um, I look. I know this is going to sound you know, melodramatic, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if in 10 years, <clears throat> Americans were going to Russia for freedom. <clears throat> Not because they're freer, <clears throat> but because we are going to be even worse than they are. <clears throat> Boy, that's a scary thought, Saul. And you know, oh. <clears throat> I, I, I think history is going to say January 6th was the low point in this yeah. country over the course of generations, and then we're going to rebound from them. I don't oh. think I'm going to be retired in, in uh, Siberia in 10 years, so. Uh, well, that's why you're retor uh, retiring, uh, Morty. Now, we, we I'd say retiring, you're, you know, finishing out Northwestern. Uh, yeah. Now, just our small podcast here, we've seen where we really have tried to be open-minded because that's what your book is about, have an open mind, have dialogue, discuss. But when you come to politics, oh my, e even if it's a school board election, you bring somebody from either side on, it's almost like uh, you've touched nuclear waste because the other side won't come on once you've, you know what, school, you've seen that on this show where, isn't it crazy? We're, 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 we're labeled, on mute, which is bad for a podcast. Yeah, which is, which, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, from my perspective of it, it's, um, I don't know if it's people want to come on and talk about it. It's the other side that doesn't, but yet they want to hide behind the keyboard and, and scream that way, which is, I don't know. I just, I, it's hard for me to gauge that perception now since I've always been kind of in that middle group forever. And, you know, recently it's, I see that the extreme ends are getting, bigger in the middle shrinking, but I don't know if that's necessarily true, if it's just more of social media. I know Trump has kind of been used as the scapegoat, but is it really more the fact that he was an outsider to the political landscape well, coming well, in the, and that, that scared people? Trump well, the a, yeah, go ahead, Saul. I just think, you know, <clears throat> Trump was a symptom. <clears throat> there weren't a lot of if there weren't a lot of polarization, he wouldn't have been elected, both because no one would vote for someone with his personality. And also, you know, you wouldn't have someone like, you know, his opponent saying that half the country was a group of basket of deplorables. And, you know, don't get people <clears throat> to get less extreme by insulting them. <clears throat> yeah. 
well, between both of them, you know, they both contributed to that. <clears throat> Well, it's, it's what what I'm seeing is it's uh, what is it called loss aversion. Uh, it's twice as painful to lose than the joy of winning. I think the other side wants to see you lose mm -hmm. rather than win, and I think that's the problem we're you know running into. And in order for people to get educated to have a to be objective, they have to read more than a headline, and. Like with a podcast, you'll do a 30 minute podcast, but they'll only look at the two minute promo and that is supposed to be the rest of the podcast, right? So it's, it, we, we really are in a loss here what to do. The people in the middle won't come on. You, the only people that will come on are highly passionate, which means they're on the polar end. And when you do bring them on, one side doesn't want to come on after the next side and you're stuck to talking to one side. It's It's a... We're trying to figure our way around it, guys. That's why we read your book. Well, you're fighting a good battle. I mean, we're passionate, even though yeah. most people would describe us as somewhere in the middle. Okay. Um, and well, here, I'll, th I'll, I'll throw this one out. Fight there, Pete. All right, we'll keep fighting. Here, here, here. Even in the this middle, is intolerant yes, well. perspectives. I mean, they're, they're intolerant, you know. It's possible to be intolerant everywhere, mm -hmm. anywhere if you just close your mind, right? Right. Um, it's true. You're more likely on the extremes, but the question is: Are you open-minded? Not, you know, not where are you on the spectrums? <clears throat> well, if you're open mind if you're open-minded, you send your kid to college. The people on the right say, "Why am I sending my kid to college to be taught liberal views?" You, you've heard that one before. What? How do you guys respond to that one? I don't teach liberal view. I just teach how to, you know. Yeah, yeah. Conservative views. I don't teach liberal views. I teach how to examine arguments, you know, and how to understand. This is what novels are good for. Um, how to understand another person's point of view, empathize intellectually and emotionally with someone unlike yourself. That, that's how I <clears throat> teach it. And you know, I I've had you know, students from different religions and different political perspectives. <clears throat> tell you all. I, I haven't found very many who <clears throat> don't think that, at least in principle, empathy is a bad thing. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, I think a lot of people worry that students would be indoctrinated because they look yeah. at the data. And we have data in the book about the vast majority of professors in American higher education, about what, 1.6 million faculty across our 4,000 colleges, universities, you know, vote Democrat. We had one line. I was from Harvard. They had two faculty out of hundreds who voted for President Trump or one or something. And, mm -hmm. you know, but people would think it's easy to indoctrinate 18 to 22 year olds have never tried to do it. Not that I've <laughs> tried to do it, but these are very independent. And, you know, Saul and I have fought for a long time at a, a range of different institutions. And, you know, these students have, they, they might give you back what you want on the test so they can get an A. But are you really going to change your view? I mean, I don't think, I don't try to, but if I tried to, I would be frustrated. Because the students are very independent minded. And well, it, isn't, that, isn't that, yes, yeah, all. No, I, I think Morty is absolutely right. You don't go in and somebody tried to indoctrinate students, <clears throat> it's very likely, uh, unlikely to succeed. The problem is not that people are being indoctrinated, but that they only hear one point of view, so they don't know <clears throat> another point of view is, and they can't take it, understand it seriously. It's not indoctrination. It's, it's lack of, of, of intellectual diversity. Well, I, I think, um, you know, just from a small sample size that I have witnessed, it's not, not, you're right, it's not indoctrination, but it's more teaching to a certain opinion, but not providing that other side to, for that student to analyze and be more open-minded about. It seems like it's, here's how I feel, and then that's the only way. So these students learn that way without opening their minds. And I don't know if that's where that comes from because you try to teach the kids to look at both points of view and then decipher for yourself the right, wrong, in between, whatever it might be. We, we grade our students in our classes now um, by how the strength of the argument you make from the opposing view. You know, the great John Stuart Mill said he only knows his own view. 
knows a little of that, right? So that's the theme for our course. It's a course on generating meaningful dialogue and, you know, right, Saul? I mean, that's how we grade them. It's, okay, here's a point of view on, say, who should get uh, vaccinated first or what do you do with the minimum wage? What do you do to improve, you know, battle against climate change? And present your view, present the strongest case from the opponent opposing view, and then talk about how your view was influenced by that. That's what we do in our weekly papers. And it gives them good practice in actually opening up their mind to the fact that they might be wrong. You know, this book about fundamentalism, the definition of fundamentalism very simply is that if you have a view that's fundamentalist, it can't be disproved. So, and if you, if, if it can't be disproved, then you're at your opposing view or, or not just misguided, they're idiots. How come they not see the truth? And once you feel that, it leads to a demise in democracy, doesn't it, So, Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> democracy <clears throat> depends on the idea of legitimate difference of opinion. That what you have <clears throat> is an opinion. God didn't speak to you directly and tell you how to vote and what. But, you know, this is the, based on your partial experience. Everyone's experience is partial. It's only a part. Based on fallible, <clears throat> you know, reasoning. Um, you haven't always been right. Your group <clears throat> hasn't always been right. And therefore, you can learn from the other. You know, sometimes you're going to make a mistake. Sometimes you have a good idea, but your execution is bad. The world is complicated, and you don't know everything. And that's why you have, it, it benefits from having different points of view. Democracy depends on that. If one side is all good and all true, and everybody else is wrong and evil, then you have, there's no reason to have a, a democracy. You have a one-party state, a dictatorship, right? Uh, so the notion that democracy depends on crediting the other side with good motives and some <coughs> arguments that you may not agree with, but which makes sense, which means you look for the best arguments on the other side, not the worst. A question about the, the future of colleges, um, because college is uh, an information delivery device. Now with YouTube and everything, uh, it, college is a information delivery device, and it's also a proctor to verify that you have the knowledge. Do you think it's possible for, for students to get knowledge from somewhere else and be able to be proctored to verify they have the information with a degree fr from somewhere? Do you think the, the, that's what the future holds? Because uh, the, the cost for education keep going up and up and up, and uh, the have and the have-nots. You know, education equals the playing field. Do you, can you give me your insight of what the future looks like for, for colleges and education? Yeah, we've actually, the first of our three books has a chapter on that. Not that I'd expect you to have read that since no. only people in our immediate families read that book, but. Um, not even them. <laughs> not, at, not, and only about half of them, but you know, you know it, I mean, you put it well. I mean, there's the human capital, teaching people things, knowledge-based. And, you know, there's a question, can you do that through MOOCs or can you do that on the web or can you do it in person? And there's a lot of value to the personal thing. We do believe in the flipped classroom that sometimes rather than just the lectures, you put the lectures online like we did last year and then you just do discussions. And so there's different ways. And I think we've learned from the global pandemic to be more effective as teachers. but there are things in addition to that uh, conveying knowledge. And, and let me just tell you stories. As president for 22 years, I, I preside over reunions. And people come back for their 10th and 25th and their 50th. And they always say, you know, President Shapiro, uh, oh, it's great to be back on campus. I said, well, what brought you back? Why do you love your institution? And they say, you know, I, I, I was in a fraternity or sorority where I did an intramural, I was in the gospel choir, I was in the band, they give all their extracurriculars. And I said, well, what else? Oh, I watched the sunrise and I did this and, I, and they give their other things and they talk about their friends. And finally I say, did you ever take a class? I mean, give me a break, I'm a professor. And literally it never even occurs to them to say I studied Shakespeare or I studied global inequality or I studied you know, uh, quantum physics. I mean, it's like, they don't even remember. Now it is what they are, 
but they learn from each other. And peer effects are incredible. And, and a number of us have actually done empirical studies of how you are influenced by your roommate, if it's random assignment. And there's a whole literature about that, but the learning outside the class. Now, Saul, for most of his career, has been a faculty fellow at one of our residential colleges. And Saul, I mean, they love your classes and my classes and other classes, but they love the residential legion experience. And that's a 24 seven education. You know, we teach a couple hours a week, right, Saul? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, it, it, it's a culture that each institution has. I know, you know, having before at Northwestern, I was at University of Pennsylvania, completely different culture. Um, and the students acculturate each other and absorb the culture, their attitudes to learning, attitudes to, you know, what's to its values, what's important. And they don't get that mostly from the classroom. They get it, you know, a bit from the classroom, but mostly, you know, mostly from each other. Um, and, you know, the courses that they do remember, you know, tend to be ones that did not just provide information, but changed something about the way they looked at life or the way they think, um, uh, or gave them an inspiration into some, you know, field that they never would have thought they had, something that really change them, you know, and if you just look at college as a way of pouring information <clears throat> into the head, <clears throat> that's really not what it is. A lot of people on the outside look at it that way, um, and they don't see why, well, why can't you just do it all, you know, as recorded lectures? What difference does it make if you're president of a lecture and <clears throat> watch it recorded? To which, you know, my, I always answer, well, do you still go to live concerts? Do you go to live sports events? Why not just watch, <clears throat> watch a recording? They, they've never thought of it. Do you go to the theater? <laughs> you know, you could watch a, you know, a play being, you know, filmed. Why do it that way? Something is added by presence, right? Um, but they haven't thought it that way. And the, the key reason, I think, is that they're thinking of education simply as information. It is information, of course, but it's not only information. <clears throat> well, the reason I bring that up, guys, is, you know, we're trying to level the playing field, the have and have nots. Having a degree from Northwestern, that's a whole lot better than a degree from a state school. You know, it's, it, it carries weight, it helps you get employed. Uh, the, the, what you major in dictates, you know, your future lifestyle. Do you think there should be some prerequisites out there for the kids so that they understand that study anything that you want, just be prepared to know that what kind of lifestyle do you want? It's you go into finance, you have one lifestyle, and if you go into another major, you it's another type of lifestyle. Do you think we should have the kids go through that? Because sometimes they get their degree and they're like, "Hey, wait a minute, it's hard to find a job." Yeah, Pete, I, I actually think they have a lot more understanding of that than others might suppose. Uh, yeah, you know, I teach a lot of econ, math, double majors, and. Some of them are, you know, the, the ones who are going into McKinsey and consulting, somewhat of a different lifestyle than if they're going to Goldman, you know, into yeah. high banking, and they know that. Then I have the other ones who are going for not-for-profits and the ones who are going to go on to law school, whatever, you know. So I think they have a pretty good appreciation. But, it, but it, as, as an economist who's written a lot on exactly what you said, how the returns to public versus private, you know, selective, less selective, one major right. versus another. The vast majority of schools, when you get your degree, yeah, they, they, you're going to do pretty well. I mean, you know, 8% of Americans who grow up in the bottom 20% of the income distribution in their mid-30s end up in the top 20%. But if you have any higher education degree, it's 24%. And if you have one from, you know, a, a flagship public, like the great one we have in Urbana-Champaign, it's 42%. Yeah. If it's from one of the prestigious privates, it's 52%. You know, so, I mean, they all give, and, and, and then one thing, I, I once wrote an article, I looked at, you know, how irrelevant it is to be in an obscured a humanity versus, humanities course versus, say, a business degree or an engineering degree. And it's, it was interesting what I found out, Saul, I think I mentioned this in our class, that it, I, I picked classics. So you're studying Latin and, and ancient Greek, right? Versus accounting. I was thinking really applied versus, and the interesting thing is when you hit it in the age in the forties, you're making the same amount of money. Now the people are in 
working in ancient Greece, right? You know, they, they learn all kinds of thinking skills and they might be in publishing or well, whatever they're in. But uh, now they may never make up for the fact that they start at 40,000 and the accountants start at, at 80, but eventually they do somewhere in the age earning profile hit that same amount. Um, so, you know, if you get a degree and you work hard, you're generally going to do really quite well compared to uh, stopping at high school. And, you know, the evidence is really clear that um, investing in higher education is a very good economics decision. Saul, anything to add to that? No, I think that's, that, I think that's, um, that's, that's right. And but the one thing I, I would say is that, you know, in reply to your question, um, if there's one thing I don't think my students either at Penn or even at Northwestern need is to be told to consider what their future career is going to be more. <clears throat> that is something they do not need to be told. <clears throat> they need to be told that, listen, that's, this is the only chance you're going to have in your life just to, to learn for the sake of learning <clears throat> in a concentrated way. That's what they need to do. Now, it, it's true. It, that's probably not true everywhere. <clears throat> I can imagine, right. um, you know, small liberal arts colleges might have a different, I don't know, well, it might be different, but certainly not in the places I've been. You know. Right. On that, Pete, is a great question, but there are these non-pecuniary, non-monetary returns to higher ed as well. And I'm sure, Scoo, you're going to see that with your child. And, you know, you, you're not only much more likely to vote, much more likely to be active in a PTA, much more likely to volunteer generally in a community. You're more likely to, you know, go to be vaccinated. More like, I mean, more likely to get vaccinated. You're more likely to do a lot of things that, that help for citizenship, uh, independent of financial returns. And those non-monetary returns are extraordinarily valuable to a democracy. So even if you're you know, deciding to go into a certain educational experience and going into a career that's not gonna make you uh, in the top 1%, you're still gonna have a lot of the attributes that make democracy thrive. I'm curious to uh, get your opinion on the the cost of the of the schooling now. I mean, it is exorbitant, and sometimes it, it for kids coming out of there that are you know financing it themselves or partial. Yeah. I mean, can they really get a job that's going to offset that debt they owe? And do you kind of see that? How is that trajectory? Is it continuing to go spiking higher or is it going to level off or, or lower? Well, you know, I can see that as a concerned parent of, an under, of a first freshman. Um, yeah, I mean, well, you know, there's again, there's a, overall, I mean, yeah, no, there's a lot of evidence. It depends on where you go, what do you major in? Right. Again, I happen to be one of the dozen or so economists who's had a whole career answering that question. So it's a little hard to summarize it in in one sentence or two, but um, there is a chapter in the economics chapter in our new book that is about forgiving debt, because you alluded to the fact that there's 1.6 trillion in, in student um, student debt, student loan debt, and should you forgive it or not, and depends on who owns, owes it and what they're doing, and we argue that blanket, you know, forgiving would be really regressive, you know, regressive tax, and it's the poor subsidizing the rich, the undereducated poor subsidizing the very well-educated rich. And that would be a terrible public policy. But there certainly are skew instances where people don't get a college degree. About 70 percent of people with student loan get got a college degree. Thirty one percent of them got a post -sec, a post collegiate degree. It's either a master's or a Ph.D. People forget about that. And you know, a lot of the, you know, at Northwestern, most of the student they get is, is Pellock students who got their MBAs and is a really good policy to forgive, you know, our MBA. I love Kellogg. I teach there. But, you know, is that good public policy to forgive debt for people who are working in the corporate world? Maybe if they're working in a not-for-profit world, you might, but it's a little more complicated than that. But, um, and at places like Northwestern, you know, a third of our students, now we're 75 thousand or so all in, but uh, a third of our students pay less than 10% of that, less than 7,500. And, um, you know, so if, if, it's, if, if you're at a school 
that has the endowment and the will to provide need-based aid, you know, you, a lot of students pay zero and then it goes up to the ones from families affluent enough like yours, presumably, to, to afford the full fee. Um, but if you look at the private colleges, universities, so you, what, what percentage of all the many millions of students at private not-for-profit colleges or universities pay the sticker price? You know what it is, Saul? I would guess about 15%. <laughs> yeah. You're, I, I hate playing this game with Saul because he knows everything. It, it, it's between 10 and 15%, depending if it's a uh, uh, college or a university. So you're right again. So, you know, for those parents who are affluent enough to pay the full extraordinary amount that we charge, um, many of them are very, very, very affluent and they could probably afford it. And actually the percentage of after-tax income that people charge for the five type, top 5% 5 of Americans to pay college tuition is a smaller percentage now than it's been, which is a shocking but true fact. So you have more money left over for other, for charity and supporting wonderful things like the North Shore podcast. <laughs> professional, professional. Gentlemen, uh, Minds Wide Shut, How the New Fundamentalisms Defied Us. It's a sequel to uh, your other book, Sense and Sensibilities. Could you give us a quick synopsis of the other book? And we would love to invite you to come back on and talk about that book as well. Can you just wet our whistle on that one, guys? Well, I can, let me start. I, that book's still doing very well. In fact, we saw a display in a bookstore in China recently where it came out a couple of months ago in, Ma in Mandarin. And apparently it's selling very well over in China. So we're very big in China. You didn't know that, but we are. They love us yeah, in China, sure. Joe. Sure, so, sure. Uh, oh, selling well. Uh, you know, one thing is, is a global market now. You get your book <laughs> translated if it's modestly successful, like most of our books, and comes out in, in other languages. A Sense and Sensibility is about, and Sense, C-E-N-T-S, is a play on Jane Austen's classic. And, and it's mm -hmm. about, you know, even though economics is a really powerful discipline, it's very insular. And if we learn from the humanities and the allied humanistic social sciences, it would be a much stronger field. Our predictions would be more accurate um, and our policies would be more effective. So Saul, what, what else from that book? Yeah, uh, um, you... You would understand <clears throat> that some problems that look like they're solvable from one point of view really need more <clears throat> than one point of view uh, <clears throat> to do. And that's what people in a profession, any profession, usually forget. They know their own tool, but they don't know to bring something else in. And so it's, it's, you know, not just economists can learn from humanists. <clears throat> humanists can learn from economists and, and everyone, you know, different fields can learn from each other. So it, part of what we're doing was an example of how that how that works. Yeah. We have a chapter basically in um, Minds Wide Shut, which sort of takes it in the other direction, how the humanists can learn from the economists. Yeah, Got it. Before in these two, that, you know, that book was easier to be, you know, not surprising that it went into paperback quickly and it's been translated and done really well. It got a great review and full page in the Wall Street Journal of New Yorker. London tie, everybody loved that book and it's sold really well. When you write about polarization, you know, we have really been criticized from the people from the squad and the far left for what we write about the Green New Deal. We have really been criticized from the right wingers because, you know, we're just yeah. liberal academics. And it, it's, it, it's been, it's doing okay, but it's struggled a bit to find a market. And when it gets reviewed in the very conservative press, you know, they usually say some good things about it, but then they usually trash me personally as, a, you know, as the king of the snowflakes as called by <laughs> Fox News, defending safe spaces and all that. And, and then the, the, the far left doesn't like Saul because he believes there's great literature. So, you know, th this one's struggled a little bit more than I expected Saul to find a market. It's doing OK, but um, it has not yet hit like our previous book, Saul. But we're not giving up hope. It's really something people, I come across, you know, people who 
agree with you, but don't want to agree with you because it's you, you know, and that's part yeah, of it. Right. Yeah, no, there's a lot of that. Um, yeah, well, well uh, Dr. Morrison, one last question. Can you summarize uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace in two sentences, please? <laughs> sure, <clears throat> I actually can. Um, the world is a place that doesn't fit a theory or intellectual system. It is filled with uncertainty and contingency, and wisdom consists in learning to make wise decisions without perfect knowledge. You know, Pete and Scott, I don't know if you watch Game of Thrones. Uh, George R. R. Martin is a proud yeah. man. We just brought him back and gave him an honorary degree, and you know, he wrote the books on which the series is based. But I was watching their famous episode where they had, I think it was called Battle of the Bastards, and they had this unbelievable fight. And right before Jon Snow says, they say, what are you going to do? How do you predict the battle? And he says, you know what? You can't predict the battle. Get a good night's sleep. And I never knew that until Saul, of teaching the class, he goes, that's a line from War and Peace, right? Isn't that what happens? When one of the generals said, you can predict it's like a chess match. If you do it. And then it turns out war is chaos. And he said, get a good night's sleep. And that was, wasn't that right, Saul? That's one of the most famous lines from the novel. All the generals are there, you know, saying, well, we need this plan and that plan and this one, and we have, we have a science of warfare, we're going to do this. And the lead general, who has been overruled by the emperors, says, gentlemen, it's already past midnight. You can't change the orders anyway. And the most important thing before a battle is a good night's sleep, meaning that in a world of uncertainty, of contingency, what matters most is not plans, but alertness. And for alertness, you need sleep. <clears throat> this is what you get, Scoo. This is what you get. This is high quality. Mike Tyson said it best. The best laid plans are thrown out the window when you get punched in the mouth. Yeah. And that's a lot about life, Pete. You know, you, yep. you always want to plan, but you need to be flexible and resilient. You really do. President Shapiro, Professor Morrison, thank you so much for coming on the North Shore podcast. Thank you, guys. It really was great fun. I wish you all the best as you battle and tolerance and you foster free speech and, and meaningful dialogue. The North Shore podcast. Well, I can, I can tell you guys that one Kindle sale was mine. I'm sure you got an extra 15 cents from it. Don't spend it all in one place. Yeah, Pete, we noticed that day was the only sale. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, we'll have the links to your books uh, on the podcast notes. We, we'll have your picks up and uh, this witty banter. Can't wait. Can't wait. Thank you both. God bless you both. Bless you both. Uh, thank you so much for listening to the North Shore Podcast. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and smash that like button on Facebook, Instagram, and follow us on Twitter. Let us know what you like to hear about in the upcoming shows. Again, I'm Pete, and I can be reached at Pete at NorthShorePodcast.com. The link will be in the podcast notes below. On behalf of my co-host, Scoo Walker, we thank you for listening, and cue the Northwestern Band. <laughs>